October the 3rd, 2010. The world's latest superliner, the new Queen Elizabeth, carves through the Mediterranean. She's in a race against time to meet her official launch date in Southampton just eight days from now. The Queen Elizabeth of 2010 is the latest in a great British tradition, the grand liners which have sailed the North Atlantic carrying their passengers in luxury. But there is a remarkably different story about this ship. Unlike her predecessors, she's been built not in Britain, but in Italy, to a deadline that once would have been unimaginable. Six months is just a glimpse of an eye on building a ship. Behind the scenes lies an extraordinary feat of engineering and creativity. While she's built in Italy, Britain's leading designers have been brought in to pay homage to the great transatlantic liners of the past. A lot of imagination has gone into this quite simple but beautiful design. This film records an extraordinary attempt to build, fit out, decorate and launch the world's latest state-of-the-art superliner faster than ever before. On the 12th of October we have our maiden voyage. We will set sail on the 12th of October. Second of July, 2009. In the Fincantieri yard near Venice, the keel of the new Queen Elizabeth is being laid. She will be 300 meters long, carry 2,000 passengers and 1,000 crew, and be capable of linking Britain and North America in five days. Keeping alive a service started by Samuel Cunard in 1840. For 170 years, Cunard have traded on reliability, safety and style. And on being British. But the yards on the Clyde which built the great liners of the past are closed. So for its newest ship, the company has turned to the Italians. Well, we built Queen Mary II and it was remarkably successful, followed shortly thereafter by Queen Victoria, and we were seeing very strong demand in, in a number of international markets, and therefore we wanted to add the third ship to the fleet. And there was only one name that we could choose for the new liner, Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth will be the third Cunarda to bear that name. The first was launched in 1938, for a two-ship transatlantic service with the legendary Queen Mary. Together, they dominated the route for 30 years. The second Elizabeth, christened QE2, entered service in 1969 and was the pride of the British merchant fleet for 40 years, and they were all built in Britain. We tried really hard to find a way of building in Great Britain. Shipbuilding is still state-supported in Italy, and that's why it's still a very strong business. In the UK, we don't do that anymore. We don't have the dry dock facilities, we don't have the shipyard strength. It's a shame, but on the other hand, there's a huge amount of British effort that goes through it. After all, we're a British brand, building ships, and, and a huge amount of British involvement in the planning, design, technology. To reinforce that claim, Cunard have commissioned the English designer David Lindley to produce the centrepiece of the Queen Elizabeth, an 18-foot-high marquetry panel on the main staircase, which recalls the Art Deco interior of the Queen Mary. And it's the age of the transatlantic liners which has inspired other British artists who've won contracts to decorate the new Queen Elizabeth. Because although Cunard is now owned by an American company, its managers know that if they are to stand out from the crowd, they must create a uniquely British ship. When you walk around Queen Elizabeth, you will feel as though you're on a great British, but very modern British experience. And of course, the Art Deco flourishes from the 30s, 40s. You know, if you like going to the Savoy, if you love Claridge's, if you love the Cunard liners of the past, you'll enjoy that experience on Queen Elizabeth. Eighty years on, Queen Elizabeth's construction owes very little to her predecessors. She's being built, like all other modern ships, in bits, prefabricated off-site and brought to the dry dock to be assembled according to a plan 
conceived by a computer. This is the fastest ship that we have done up to now in six months. Honestly speaking, it is a challenge for us. And these are the blocks that we laid down in July. In red, we have the lock that have been laid down in August, and then September in yellow, October. So you can appreciate that as fast we were to build up the ship up to the floating out. That floating out from the dry dock has been set for January the 5th, 2010, which means Queen Elizabeth's hull and superstructure must be ready in six months. Programs and schedules are getting very, very tight. And uh, this ship, uh, maybe the biggest challenge we have is to build it in the dry dock uh, stage, giving it only six months. If they succeed, it will be Fincantieri's fastest build since this yard opened in 1908. If you think of what six months is just a glimpse of an eye on building a ship. So everything is going according to schedule and we keep quality standards high, as high as possible to keep the owner uh, happy, the customer happy. But of course we cannot uh, slip of just a minute, that's what we have to stick with. Program is everything. Six months, it's a very short time on a dry dock for a 300 meters long ship. To keep on schedule, a night shift is added so that work on the new Cunada is now taking place around the clock. And so that one shift is not waiting for the other, managers have to work even harder on coordination. Ship is built in blocks. Blocks are uh, small units of steel that uh, build what we see after a complete ship. After the blocks, we put them together and build the sections, which are normally what we can see here, one side from the other of the ship, and looks like a little building. This is going to be the very aft of the ship in the upper decks. If we look at the aft part now, there is a section hanging uh, from the crane the white one, which has been just laid on top, needs to be put in the correct place. You have to check dimensionally that it stays in the correct place with the rest of the structure and needs to be welded. We have an average of uh, 2,000 people working on board every day, including Saturdays. Sundays we slow down, but we don't stop. The dry dock stage will be followed by nine months of fitting out, but the deadlines are concentrating minds. Some are starting to wonder if, in just 15 months, it's possible to build, fit out and deliver one of Britain's greatest liners. In Italy, at Europe's largest shipyard, they're building the new Cunard liner Queen Elizabeth. 2,000 men have been assigned to this 350 million pound project. They're working night and day to meet an amazing deadline. The ship must be floated out on January the 5th, 2010, just six months after her keel was laid. Managers at Fincantieri know there's only one way to build a ship in six months, by prefabricating sections off-site which requires careful coordination between Antonio Bartolini, responsible for the interior of the ship, and Simon Skarmenchin, in charge of the dry dock. The most of the work is not only the blocks, is the outfitting, is uh, the, the managing of the structure of the people who work uh, around the dry dock and uh, the, the cranes, the problem that you, that you find here, the, the, the manufacturing, the construction of the shipyard is uh, is exposed uh, to the to the weather to the rain to the sun so is a is a is a hard and uh, and uh, very complex work that uh, uh, involves a lot of uh, people and a lot of uh, technical resources so this is a, a very challenging uh, uh, work uh, for me december 2009 one week before christmas the skies are clear but it's minus five degrees celsius and a local wind the borer has been blowing from the Croatian mountains for a week at 70 miles an hour. The yard's cranes have been sitting idle, 
too dangerous to use in the high winds. Queen Elizabeth is slipping behind. At the first break in the wind, Simon Skarmenchin is supervising the lifting of a prefabricated steel section using one of Europe's strongest cranes, capable of lifting a thousand tons. The quayside has been cleared, because after a week sitting alongside the ship, this section contains tons of water and ice. Just for a moment, Work on Cunard's new ship comes to a halt as workers watch Fincantieri's biggest crane in action. Simon will have to adjust his schedule to account for the peculiar weather conditions. For this is a tightly regulated game of supply and demand. Queen Elizabeth has two and a half million meters of cable whose delivery from the stores to the ship has to be carefully timed. It must be installed according to a wiring diagram approved by the UK Maritime Safety Authorities because this is a British ship registered in Cunard's home port of Southampton and insured by Lloyds of London. Systems actually need to be um, uh, fixed and inspected, every single part of it. Look, for example, these cables, which are long-run cables, they need to be pulled, they, they need to be secured, with rules and inspected by the inspectors uh, in order that they can assess if the cable is safe in event of fire. On this deck, the wiring must be completed before the prefabricated cabins can be installed. This is a cabin deck and is a, a deck for deluxe cabins. And here we can see the number of the cabin. So the cabin of deck four, number 48, will be placed here, right in front of this door. And then if we move along, we can see the trays for the AC that stays for is the air conditioning box, which you know, provides uh, conditioned air to the cabin. And then, moving along, we can see here the place where there will be the technical space between two toilet units of two different cabins where all the systems of the toilet spaces and the cabins are concentrated. And here, there will be the corridor. These are not the only cabins Antonio is overseeing. The shipyard is rushing to deliver the Azura to P&O. It has 2,300 cabins. Queen Elizabeth has 1,600. But while the Azura is almost complete and ready to sail for Southampton, Queen Elizabeth has a long way to go. This is a precise operation. There's only 30 millimeters clearance between the top of the prefabricated cabin and the top of the deck. Even a wrongly aligned forklift will cause it to get stuck as it comes aboard. Not all the Queen's cabins are prefabricated. Curiously, doing that would actually slow down the build because the cabin installers would be waiting for the wirers. So about half the cabins are built on board in the traditional way. Because the condition is to have all the systems done before we introduce the prefabricated cabin on the ship, this is why for certain areas we have to wait the systems and so we have to go with the cabins built in situ but Fincantieri are getting better at coordinating their ship builds in the hope that one day 100% of a ship's cabins will be constructed off-site and hauled aboard. Queen Elizabeth is coming together. Its sweeping staircases are emerging. They're building the Britannia restaurant at the stern of the ship. This restaurant, the lower part, is for 564 people, all together is over 870 people. And the Royal Court Theatre is starting to look like the English provincial theatres which inspired its design. It will seat 800 people. The peculiarity of the theatre is these small balconies 
for the passengers to stay as close as possible to the shed. The engines are in. Four V12s, which together will develop 16,000 horsepower. They'll provide electric power for two azipods, steerable propeller pods, which can turn through 360 degrees. So the engines don't need propeller shafts and the ship won't need a rudder. It's the first time this shipyard has worked with Azipod technology and inspectors from Lloyd's Register are here to make sure they've got it right. The Azipods mean Queen Elizabeth will be highly manoeuvrable in a way that the captains of early Cunard ships could only dream of. In the years after his first trip between Liverpool and Halifax in 1840, Samuel Cunard came to dominate the Atlantic. He fought off American competition by being safer and more reliable. And in 1919, his company dreamt up the idea of building two huge ocean-going liners with which to establish a weekly service between the old and the new worlds and to capture the blue ribbon for the fastest crossing. The first, the Queen Mary, was launched in 1934. Queen Elizabeth followed in 1938. But it was the Queen Mary which caught the public's imagination. The Paramount News plane with the veteran ace Charlie Stoffer at the controls and Urban Santone at the camera is first to greet the great liner still 50 miles at sea. It's only a little after dawn and the Queen Mary is cracking down at 33 knots, the top speed of her voyage across. She didn't break the Normandy record but the officers say they didn't think it wise to open up her engines full. Anytime they want, so the Englishmen say, they can take that record away. But today belongs to the Queen Mary. She is the guest of New York. Our speed came up above our expectations, and everybody was very pleased with what the ship did. Are you going to try for the Blue Ribbon, Captain? Well, naturally, that's what we're out for. She was always the most popular ship, and I, I sense it had to do with her conventional maiden entry into service. She had time to build up a clientele uh, before World War II. The Elizabeth did not. Queen Mary always brought back passengers. She became sort of the safe old lady, so to speak. But she, in a sense, looked back. The Queen Elizabeth looked forward. She had a lot of refinements, like a clipper stem, freestanding funnels, no forward well deck, and a scheme of interior decoration far in advance of Mary. Mary, the worst thing that could be said about the Queen Mary was that she was the worst of Leicester Square cinema. This is what one unkind critic said. But that became endearing. People sort of fell in love with it, and they became sort of a, a cherished keepstone of the age. Mary represented something that the Elizabeth never did. The task of bringing out the best of the old liners and transferring it into a ship for the 21st century has been given to art director Amy Lucena from Los Angeles. We really are on this ship trying to give a tribute to the golden age of cruising. Uh, Cunard is really attached to their history uh, of that time and um, hearkening back a little bit more than for her sister, Queen Victoria, which was more Victorian, sort of traditionally elegant. This will be more Art Deco. Amy has done it all before. It starts with the architect of the ship. The outside spaces dictate the inside spaces. Once those drawings are done, uh, the design team starts to work together, and I work very closely with the coordinating architect and the head designer. The room really takes shape from the fabrics, the colors, the idea behind the room. Not necessarily a theme, per se, but the idea and the feeling and the image they want to project in a room. And then you start presenting. Well, what about something like this, something like this, something like this? And then you find the artist who can create your vision. Amy has commissioned a range of British artists and designers, led by the Queen's nephew, David Lindley. In Linley's London studio, Mark Blanchard is working on an 18-foot-high marquetry panel for the Grand Lobby. We, we started with um, some sketch ideas here, um, and we really wanted to incorporate classic Art Deco style, and we used the rising sun motif, which was very popular at the time. And we wanted the, the cruise liner to be a central part of the panel. 
Linley's creation, which shows the new liner straddling the world, uses bird's eye maple, burr walnut, black American walnut, Macassar ebony and satin walnut, the classic Art Deco veneers which were used in the Queen Mary. I think a lot of imagination has gone into this quite simple but beautiful design. It harks back to the golden age of uh, Cunard and Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth and all those great ships and I think it also takes us forward into the future by the way that it has been uh, updated in its manufacturing. You know, it's an enormous object. Not many people can do that kind of thing. It's also a sense of tradition and heritage and to do with the country and everything else like that. So all those things mixed together make it uh, very honourable for us to have been asked. We're delighted to take part and uh, hope we're up to the job. At the turn of the year, Queen Elizabeth is ready to take to the water. She'd be floated out of the dry dock almost exactly six months to the day since the keel was laid, a record in the history of building this type of ship, and a first for Fincantieri. Simone Skarmanchin will hand responsibility for her to someone else and start work on his next liner. Cunard have invited Denny Farmer, the widow of Willie Farmer, chief engineer of the first Queen Elizabeth, to perform the float-out ceremony. How are you, Denny? She's welding three coins to the superstructure, marking the launches of the great queens. 1938 for the original Queen Elizabeth, 1967 for the QE2, and 2010 for this ship. It will take 24 hours to fill the dry dock and another four days to complete all the safety checks before Queen Elizabeth is towed to another part of the shipyard. It's 72 years since the first Queen Elizabeth was launched at John Brown shipyard on the Clyde. In the same way that the Queen Mother named that ship, Cunard have invited her daughter to christen this one on October the 11th which means Britain's newest liner must leave here on September the 30th without fail. The clock is ticking. At the Fincantieri shipyard near Venice, Cunard's newest liner, Queen Elizabeth, has been floated out of the dry dock just six months after her keel was laid. She's been built in record time. Forty years ago, it took two years to get her predecessor, the QE2, to this stage. Now, the new Queen Elizabeth must be fitted out with all the comforts which Cunard passengers expect. Booking for the maiden voyage on October the 12th, 2010, has opened and sold out in 30 minutes. So being late is out of the question. Though she's still owned by Fincantieri and will remain so until the handover at the end of September, Queen Elizabeth is starting to receive her first Cunard staff. The chief engineer, Colin Black, and the deputy captain, Hamish Sunter, are coming aboard. Colin Black started his career in a power station in Glasgow and never dreamt that one day he would be in charge of the power plant of a 92,000-ton ocean-going liner. I never thought of it. Never thought of it once. I remember being at school looking at the QE2 and, and also when I was still working in the power station looking at the QE2 going off to the Falklands. And that was, uh, it was quite special really. And to be part of the build of the Queen Elizabeth was quite breathtaking really. Each engine, each of the, the four 12 cylinders is 12,000 kilowatts. That's approximately around about 16,000 horsepower. So we've got four V12 engines at 12,000 kilowatts and we've got two inline eight cylinders at 8,000 kilowatts, 24 knots max. Colin will stay with the build until the ship sails, but he's not allowed to touch anything. For now, Queen Elizabeth belongs not to Cunard, but to Fincantieri. In the engine room, they're testing one of the engines, but Colin can only watch and wait. That's uh, a great advantage of being here 
in the build and being able to understand the systems as they've been put together and tested. Because even though the, the sister ship is Queen Victoria, there's no such thing as the same. It could be the same on paper, but it's always different on the build. By May, the pace of work is quickening, and it needs to. Having done so well in the dry dock, now that she's lying alongside, Queen Elizabeth is eight weeks behind schedule. This is partly because fitting out relies so heavily upon suppliers delivering on time, and there's a lot of material to supply. 14,000 square meters of carpet, 1,100 staff mattresses, 18,000 coat hangers, thousands of square meters of glass. The list goes on and on. Cunard have appointed Chris Wells captain of the Queen Elizabeth. But because he's serving in Queen Victoria and won't be available until the summer, the deputy captain, Hamish Sunter, has the job of checking that this ship is being built to the company's specifications. She's looking splendid, yeah. She's a modern ship, of course. Yeah, not like the QE2, but um, yeah, she's looked good. The colours are very good. And, um, you know, once she's in the water, you know, sunk down, ballasted, they do look good. Whilst I'm on site, now he's walking around the ship, um, looking at how the ship has been built. So it's built for when it's in operation, it's what Cunard require on the deck side and security. We come on board, have a look around, learn the systems, look at the boats, how the boats are operated. So once we do take it, we basically we take over on the day, we know what's going on. The extensive testing of this ship is very different from the experience of the first Queen Elizabeth. Built by John Brown in 1938, she was designed as a companion for the Queen Mary, which was already plying the North Atlantic. Together, they would establish Cunard's weekly transatlantic shuttle. But Queen Elizabeth's fitting out was overtaken by the Second World War. The world's largest liners, Queen Mary and the Normandy, sought sanctuary in New York. Queen Elizabeth stayed in Scotland. Finally, Cunard instructed Captain John Townley to set sail and open sealed orders only when he reached the mouth of the Clyde. He thought he was going to Southampton. The signal read, take your ship to New York. They sailed across with no preparation whatsoever. The, there was launch gear affixed beneath the hull. She'd had no engine trials whatsoever, and she had no passengers. She had 14 technical people from John Brown's yard. And they crossed in utter surprise to America. America had no idea the ship was coming. And then finally, a Coast Guardsman on the Fire Island Beach on the south shore of Long Island saw this great grey ghost because the ship had been completely painted grey before she left uh, John Brown's yard, coming out of the fog. And that was the first sight. She steamed past the Statue of Liberty, went up the Hudson. So the three largest ships in the world were tied up in New York for two weeks in the dark days of March of 1940. Cunard's two transatlantic liners went to war. The Mary could manage 34 knots and outrun German U-boats. The Elizabeth was the world's biggest ship, capable of carrying 16,000 troops. But they were being asked to do something for which they had not been designed. The Queens were designed just to go back and forth across the Atlantic and they had to be refueled at each end. Suddenly, if they were sent to Trincomalee or Port Tufik or Sydney, they had to find refueling points along the way because they couldn't refuel for more than five days. Without five days, then they were out of, out of juice, so to speak. And so it was a terrible adjustment, huge adjustment, to make these transatlantic giants work globally. But they did. Winston Churchill said that using the Queens to bring American troops to Britain shortened the war by a year. And when peace broke out, the Mary and the Elizabeth, still in their wartime grey, took the GIs home. Back on board Queen Elizabeth, 
Fincantieri have drafted in more workers to put the project back on schedule. Amy Lucena, the art director, has had to negotiate with the safety inspectors, who aren't keen on David Lindley's huge panel of woods in the main lobby. And there appears to be a difference between the size of the space on board and the dimensions on the plans sent from London. The panel may not fit in its allocated space, or it may be simply getting lost in translation. Yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. It's, it's actually, important to get it right now, because the panel will only be installed at the last minute, by which time it will be impossible to make alterations. At the same time, Amy is keeping in touch with other British artists whose work she's commissioned. In a Somerset village, Harley Crossley is working on the official portrait of the new ship. As a youngster, um, my first ever job um, was uh, in the Ocean Terminal in Southampton Docks and I was a, a messenger and clerk in there and when I think back all these giant ocean liners you used to see them every day you know, Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth, United States, France, Norway oh wonderful, wonderful, absolutely fabulous during the lunch hours I'd go and sit on a bollard close to where the crew would come off the ship and do a quick sketch and sort of uh, hope somebody would come along and say, here lad, how much do you want for that, you know? And I, and I found that uh, on a good week, I could earn more during the lunch hour than I could working for the company. <laughs> Harley is working in oils, using just two knives and a technique called wet on wet. Cunard have asked him to portray Queen Elizabeth from the bow, which on modern ships is rather more attractive than the stern. You've got this big impressive bow and of course uh, Cunard ships are unusual nowadays in so much as they have this very dark grey hull. Um, whereas if you think of most ships that cruise the world nowadays, they're all white, they're white all over. Uh, and and, and this, this takes you back to the age of, of these wonderful transatlantic liners. They all had uh, black or dark grey hulls. People often say, after they've watched me for a while, they say, my gracious me, I never knew it was as easy as that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose the cheeky answer to that is, yes, it is easy. Mind you, the first 25 years are quite difficult. <laughs> Harley's portrait will hang outside the purser's office in the heart of Cunard's newest liner. If you go on the ship, you're not going to be able to miss it. It's going to be right in the middle. <laughs> Nor will passengers miss the murals in the Commodore Club, painted by Robert Lloyd. They show a special moment in time, one of only two occasions on which Cunard's ships came together before the QE2 was retired. From an artistic point of view, uh, you want a painting to have impact that passengers will see and they'll go, wow. Um, but at the same time, all the three ships are all very long ships. Um, so uh, to try and create a, uh, a layout that works is very difficult. I like the technical aspect of ships. Um, I'm interested in the engineering. Um, of them, um, you know, the sheer size of them I find sort of quite fascinating. Um, some artists have uh, a much, much more sort of wishy-washy type of um, style, um, and I appreciate that, but, um, you know, I, I just like the technical aspect of these ships, and, and I wanted to be an engineer, but uh, my maths ability is virtually non-existent. But Robert is not above using artistic license. His other commission is for a painting of the original Queen Elizabeth in New York, a scene some passengers may recall, although they may not recognise all the scenery. Occasionally I do add in um, a few things that uh, you really have to look at very closely at the painting to see. Um, I've actually um, uh, put two warehouses in the background that have my two daughters' uh, names on them, uh, Lily Towing, uh, and Amelia Shipping. Uh, the lady who actually is the art consultant uh, uh, for this project, uh, she has her own warehouse over here called Lucena Shipping. But I like to have a little sense of humour with them. Harley Crossley and Robert Lloyd are veteran maritime artists. But Cunard wanted to encourage new talent. So they invited entries for a piece of art which will sit in the Queen's room. And they found the winner in Edinburgh, a 20-year-old art student Peter Simpson. My inspiration from this piece stemmed from Augustin Jean Fresnel's lighthouse lenses that he created in the 19th century. 
and I was initially intrigued by these because they actually had a lot of Art Deco qualities about them. Say a traditional lighthouse lens was shaped like a semicircle like this, whereas a Fresnel lens was cut at certain angles that meant that light transferred um, just as well through it, but was a lot lighter. Um, so I wanted to kind of transplant these angles and take them onto a simple form that was just distilled to its absolute essence so that it was um, hopefully beautiful and clear. The judges, led by the director of the Royal Academy, thought Peter's take on Fresnel's light was intriguing. It was actually my dad who um, picked up the phone uh, to hear the news um, because I was away at college at the time. But when they came to pick me up, you know, and... Uh, you know, told me the news. It was incredible um, and astounding. F I feel incredibly honoured and, and just can't wait to see my design actually being, you know, made into the finished article. Peter Simpson's competition winning sculpture is off to California to be cast at full size and then shipped on to Italy. And on Queen Elizabeth, Amy Lucena has sorted out the confusion over the Linley panel. She's used to coping. This is her 15th ship. In the end, we're all working towards one final destination, which is the finish of the ship. Sometimes there's a problem with the contractor, a problem with the dimension, but we're all going to the same place, and eventually we always get there. Nevertheless, the eight-week delay, which the shipyard is now reducing, has had an effect. The first sea trials, scheduled for the end of July, have been put back to mid-August. The Fincantieri are sticking with September the 30th as the handover date. And Cunard have developed an official line for all inquiries. Are you on schedule? Yes, yes, we're on schedule. Yeah. Yeah. I've experienced this yard in Fincantieri many times and you know every day there's a maybe two steps back, but next day there's two steps forward, so. I've got every confidence that the ship will sail in end of September. Next time on Britain's Greatest Ships, Queen Elizabeth in a race against time. We are six weeks away from seeing cast on stage rehearsing, so it's really, uh, we're getting to that exciting time. I'm currently managing teams that are producing shows and teams that are helping us to deliver the ship and it all has to come together at the same time. We're pretty much on track um, and all those areas that were slightly behind have now all caught up and the yard I have to say are working very hard. I think there's over 1600 workers on the ship today as we're going around. The 12th of October we have our maiden voyage and we certainly can't let those guests down. We've got the majority of our stores in the next few days before we get back to Southampton. We've got to find everything, but I think we're, we're almost there. Obviously, it's looking good. This is the captain. The ship is ours. Well, our friends at Fincantieri have delivered for us, and the magic part now is seeing our own crew bringing the ship to life.